Hello, everybody. Um, so uh, just, just a quick announcement before we start. Uh, this room uh, it has occupancy only for as many as the chairs are in here. I know that not all the chairs are filled, but please make sure you get a chair so that when the new people come in, if they have only standing room, uh, they would need to leave just due to the um, fire code, just to give you guys a heads up. Um, so the next talk is uh, what is a PLC and how do I talk to it uh, with Python? Uh, Sorry. Uh, and uh, speaker is uh, John Snubert. Please welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start with a quick story about myself and why I'm giving this talk. Uh, back at the turn of the century, uh, I was in high school, and I managed to talk myself into an internship at the nearby semiconductor factory. And this was the coolest thing I had ever seen. And uh, since then, I've been fascinated by the role that software plays in building these amazingly complex machines that we call factories. But I also sometimes feel a little bit like I've stumbled upon this weird niche. Most software developers never even encounter factory automation as a place where you can apply your skills. And at conferences like this, uh, the topic has a little bit of a low profile. Same podcasts, blogs, and all the other places where software engineers uh, exchange knowledge. So I thought to myself, uh, I'm going to give a software conference talk about a factory topic every calendar year. And you all are here to see 2019 being checked off the list. The topic I uh, decided to bring today is PLCs, and that stands for Programmable Logic Controllers. And if you do a quick survey of people who've worked with PLCs before, they usually think of factories as the place where they live. So if you had to walk through there, uh, you would look for the metal enclosure, the electronics cabinet, and if it has a couple of buttons, a couple of readouts and stuff on it, you open it up, you might find a PLC in there. They're usually hanging out near the robots, also in standalone equipment like the window tinting machine, if you don't have access to factories, out and, out and about, maybe you're near wind energy, they have PLCs in the controller cabinet at the bottom, near the gearbox at the top, they control the angle at which the rotor blades are set to the wind, uh, construction machines, theme parks, car washes, uh, public transit vehicles have PLCs, trains often have a network of them, they're in each carriage doing stuff like traction control and AC, and in the cockpit at the driver's dashboard. Uh, buildings like this, the HVAC system, the lighting, the elevators uh, are controlled by PLCs. You go to the roof to get to the control room or into the basement. Sometimes it's at the elevator itself. There are places where, there's, where you think there's a PLC, but there isn't one, like traffic control cabinets at your regular intersection. There are so many of these things, and they're pretty simple. You don't need programmable logic, so you just buy off-the-shelf electronics. But as soon as you have traffic management for the whole city, wiring all these intersections up, or you have a tram crossing the intersection, it becomes custom logic again, and uh, more than likely, uh, you'll find a PLC in these boxes. So uh, there's that thing where people say when you're in a big city, you're never more than 10 feet away from a rat. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add to that urban myth and say you're also never more than 50 feet away from a PLC. Uh, using that as motivation, uh, this is the outline of the talk. Super simple, because it's actually in the talk title. First, we talk about what is a PLC. Second, we talk about what do we do with Python to interface to them. And then at the very end, we deal with the dreaded Raspberry Pi question. Uh, I talk fast. Some of my slides are really full, because I want you to be able to use them as reference material after the talk is over. So if you want to follow along, the, the link to the slides is right there. Uh, if that's too much to type, my Twitter, uh, uh, you can look up. I just tweeted out a link to the slides as well. And uh, with that, let's dive right in. Um, I'm going to take you along the journey of what happens when you decide to use a PLC in your project. Well, step one, you go to your purchasing department, you get a quote and all that stuff. You, in the end, you order one, you get a package, you open it up, you get one of those things. Depending on how much money you spend, how difficult your application is, you get like a compact form factor, which has a limited set of features that uh, you can't extend, or you go all the way to the expensive, expansible ones where you just keep adding modules uh, to uh, continue expanding the PLC to meet your features. Spend a day or maybe a week on setting it up. It looks like it's grown a ponytail or two. Uh, those are the wires coming out of it. Um, these are stock photos on the slide. When I do it, it looks like what's on the stage here because I actually brought a little PLC that's already blinking away, waiting to be used in our demo. Um, 
Those wires are actually a hint about what PLCs do, because I haven't, for anyone who hasn't used a PLC before, I haven't actually managed, uh, mentioned what they do yet. Uh, those wires are a hint. They're connected to field devices that are out in the factory or in the wind turbine or whatever it is you're controlling. And um, that tells you that the natural habitat for PLCs is always right at this boundary where the world of software with bits and bytes meets the world of the, the physical world with atoms and electrons. It actually makes sense to give a quick intro to field devices and, and I.O., input-output. It's a term that gets used a lot. And of course, field devices is just a fancy word for sensors and actuators. Sensors, of course, are the devices that uh, look at an observable phenomenon in the physical world, uh, turn it into an electrical signal, which then becomes a variable in your code, and actuators are the other way around. Uh, they take a variable in your code, turn it into an electrical signal, which then becomes an effect in the physical world. The slide is super complicated, but it's really just to uh, illustrate that there are many different kinds of electrical signals out there, because physics is hard, standardization is hard. So uh, for your sensors, you might have you know, anywhere up to 10 different signal types, and that's where those modules I mentioned earlier come in. You can't just plug any signal into any port of your PLC. You purchase the set of modules that matches the signals that you need. Really, the only important distinction for us to understand here uh, to follow the rest of this talk is that some signals are digital, which means the physical phenomenon is on or off, the electrical signal is high or low, and the variable becomes a Boolean variable. Uh, and there are analog signals, which are things that uh, are continuous variables. You need to measure the electrical signals much more accurately, and then it becomes a number in your code. Uh, on the slide here, I purchased a PLC and I added one, two, three, four, five, six uh, modules to it to deal with different types of signals, both digital inputs, abbreviated DI, and uh, analog inputs and stuff like that, and digital outputs abbreviated DQ. Wait, what? Uh, that seems to be a common thing in automation engineering. I think it's because the O for output would be too similar to zero, so they say DQ, and you'll see that a couple of times in my variable names later. Cool. We purchased it, we wired it up. What does it do? Same thing as any compute device in the world. It goes through the IPO cycle, and the first step, inputs, uh, we read the process variables from the field. That basically means we look at the electrical signals, and the PLC turns those into variables, stores them in memory in a place called the process image in. Then in step two, we run some kind of logic, do some computation, and uh, hopefully turn our input variables into output variables, because that's what programmers usually do in their functions. Uh, and we write, those get written to the process image out. PLC takes over again, turns those variables in the process image out to electrical signals to our actuators, which might be a motor or a, a fan or whatever it is that we're controlling. Obviously, the interesting bit to us is step two, because that's where we can have an effect on what's going on in the PLC. We can program it. And that's also where the name comes from, because that's where the programmable logic lives. So just a quick recap, uh, we determined that PLCs are the things that interface between the world of software and the physical world. They're wired up to field devices that show up as digital and analog inputs and, and the like, and we can program them to affect their behavior. So uh, let's do a quick demo with uh, this guy that I've got here, and I'm going to fire up my favorite text editor and start uh, programming the PLC. Just kidding, uh, you don't program PLCs with text. And uh, also, you don't use your favorite program, you use the one program that the vendor of your PLC gave you to program it. <laughs> um, actually, I selected the PLC that I brought today based on the fact that the software is sort of like clean enough that I can put it on a presentation screen and it's not like full of a million images. And I'm going to do this trick where I zoom in every now and then to make it even easier for you to see. So this is the programming environment we have. On the very left, we see this big line. Imagine that's like under pressure or there's uh, electricity coming in. And the electricity is trying to travel down those uh, horizontal lines to get to the right. And we get to put like electrical circuit elements there. And I'm going to put a normally open contact that looks at the variable di1. And what that basically means, it's like an if statement. If di1 becomes true, current is traveling here where my cursor is dancing around. And if it stays false, well, current can't get there. So we're going to make use of that, and whenever current gets there, we're going to switch dq1 to true. So we really just have sort of the hello world of, the PL of PLCs. If the i is true, make dq true, otherwise both of them are false. I'm going to go online with my PLC, PLC, which I should have done before the talk. Now I can program it. 
and I connected the two with a network cable here, just my laptop's connected to the PLC for programming. So the program is over there now. Uh, now we're going to test, actually, um, at home I usually do this with an LED and stuff, an LED small thing, but uh, since you can't see that, I grabbed one of those for you. <laughs> um, so those are the digital outputs, and I got the corresponding digital input as well. Uh, and we press the button, and this is what's happening. Digital input is true, digital output becomes true. And actually, I switched this into monitoring mode, so if you watch the screen, uh, you can actually see what those variables are doing, which is really kind of cool. Um, but then you install it, and the kids come, and you go like, ah! So uh, we want to fix that a little bit, and instead of the output, we put a timer here, and we say we want to count up to two seconds, which in this weird programming language is uh, 200 and we're going to give it a variable name for the current value, and we're going to give it a variable name for when it's done. So timer one done will be true when timer finished counting, and we add a second rule to our set of rules and say, if timer one is done, then we actually want to switch that output dq1 on. Uh, program that over to the PLC again. And uh, I'm going to do that zooming in trick. So if I press the button, you see the timer starts running, but the output doesn't come on yet. Only if I keep it running for two seconds does the light come on. If I let go, the timer resets. I press it again, the timer starts counting again. So we already know two little primitives of this uh, language that we're, we're working in. I have one more sort of like party trick here. Uh, I'm going to insert another row before, second timer which also counts to two seconds. I'm going to call this timer2 value and timer2 done. And now I'm going to put a couple of crazy rules in front of those. I'm going to say a normally closed contact. So I want timer2 to start counting when timer1 is not done. So that little thing with a strike through here, that's an basically an if not statement. Oops, thank you, Windows. Um, and then I change this to say timer1 is counting when timer2 is done. And then I want my output on when timer 2 is done. Look at this for a second. I'm going to click program, and you have three more seconds to try to figure out what this is actually doing when it runs. And we build ourselves a little flashing light. How cool is that? Quick pro tip for anyone who's coming to the US from outside the country, when you see a traffic signal like this, it's actually the equivalent of a stop sign. You have to stop before you keep moving. I lived here for three years, I had no idea. <laughs> and um, it's a bit distracting, so I'm going to stop the PLC. So I actually, over this network cable, tell the PLC to stop. I should clarify this. All the code is running in the PLC. My laptop is only connected to do the programming. It's a programming interface, and it has this cool monitoring interface where the PLC reports what's going on inside of it. My laptop is not running any of the code. What did we just see? Uh, the language we program in, and here's a little ASCII art representation of the same concept, is called ladder logic, because when you add a lot of rules, it looks like a ladder. Uh, and uh, the terminology is kind of cool. Uh, you have a hot rail. I told you the analogy is that it's under, uh, it has voltage applied to it. When you touch it, it kind of saps you, it feels hot. Uh, there's a neutral rail where the current is trying to get to, and we call those conditionals that we place there the contacts, and the outputs the coils. The general rule of thumb in textbook 101 is read uh, from left to right, top to bottom, and you'll understand what's going on. But why are we doing this stuff? Ah, that is how you program control systems before PLCs existed. Those are relays. If you go to the top of an old building, you might find an elevator control room that still has this kind of stuff in it. And the way people programmed elevators, production lines, everything, is arrange these relays uh, and wire them up in such a way that the, the logic results in it. And if you've ever used a relay, you know that the place where you hook up your voltage inputs is called the contact, like in that programming language we just used, and the, you energize the coil, which means the, uh, the relay is activated and passes current through it, acting basically like a switch. So this is where this is coming from. It's taking inspiration uh, from old relay control logic. You can have two views on this. You can have the hacker news view, where you think that everything is a startup opportunity and needs to be disrupted, and you say, many other industries are stuck in the technological dark ages. The industrial automation community still programs in ladder logic. 
Or, oh, by the way, this is the only reference to ladder logic in 13 years of Hacker News. Um, <laughs> or you can have a slightly more like, a different uh, attitude to things and realize that this programming language has been around for 50 years, so it's got to have something going for it. And maybe that something is that it is truly the common denominator across all brands of PLC which you can purchase. And it's part of the curriculum for most automation engineers and electricians in the world. They learn this as part of their degrees. And that's important because as soon as this thing is programmed by whoever the automation integrator is, it gets shipped to the factory and ownership transfers to the factory maintenance department, which is staffed with technicians and electricians. And they are now in charge of keeping this thing running and fixing it when it breaks, sometimes for decades. And if you think about that, it basically means that ladder logic is a programming language that's purely designed for debugging and not at all for the person writing it which is kind of cool, like none of the languages I work in every day uh, have that trait. Cool. So we've, um, we've looked at what the PLCs are, about halfway point here, everyone's like, where's Python? Uh, so second demo, and I, I need to do a little bit of setup, so you've got to bear with me. First of all, I'm going to close this project that we worked on, little hello world, and I open up a slightly bigger one, which I prepared uh, for this talk. Uh, and I'm going to program that over to the PLC. Actually, what you see here in the background is a bit of a design pattern. In ladder logic, you often use the main program to call a couple of subtasks, like subroutines. The interesting one really is the pedestrian crossing one here. So I switch the PLC to run. I'm going to switch on my monitoring. And we'll just quickly run through this program as we actually run it. So I'm going to press the button, and you can watch the variables change on the screen again. So we press. There's a couple of timers down here that go in sequence. They all fire and are wired up so that one starts counting when the next one is done. And at the bottom, we have a bunch of logic that basically says which light needs to come on. I totally forgot I brought one of those as well. <laughs> all right. Um, now, what's different about this program compared to the one we had before, that if you zoom in on what this timer is doing, Earlier, we had a constant value here. I put 200 for two seconds, and now I put a, a variable there. It's actually a bit of a luxury that we have variable names in PLCs. Some of them, you still have to use memory addresses. This one, helpfully, has this tag database, which lists all the variables we have uh, to map them to a memory address. So we have our DIs, DQs, a bunch of like timer-done variables. And all the way at the bottom are my timer durations. And you can see that something's different about them. They have this mod start and mod end, which are addresses in a, for a protocol called Modbus. So what's going on here is that uh, obviously people wanted to wire these uh, controllers together, so they developed a number of protocols where PLCs can write into each other's memory. Uh, and the way this particular protocol works is that you give a numeric address for certain variables, and then they become accessible over the network. This was meant for other PLCs, but we have computers now, uh, so we can pretend to be a PLC on your computer by doing pip install pi modbus. And I came prepared, so I have it already. So we're going to write a little bit of script to talk to the PLC. I'm running a bit behind, so I'm going to use that, um, that arrow up trick to autocomplete a number of times here. So we get a modbus client, we connect to our PLC, which has an IP address. And then using this client, we can do things like read those registers, and um, I just know that I have to start at address 0 and go for 12, and voila, we have our numbers that are the durations for our timers. That's cool. We can also write them, and I'm going to use that feature to fix the traffic light, because why would pedestrians have to wait for two seconds until it even switches to yellow? Let's make that 100 milliseconds. By the way, that 0 that's kicking around over here, that's a bit of a quirk of the protocol. I don't have time to explain that. You'll just have to accept that we keep reading and writing a zero after the numbers we care about. Um, so now I set the first variable to 10 instead of 200. You can read that right back. And what that means, we press the button, it instantaneously goes to yellow. That's cool, we fix the traffic light, pedestrians are happy, but word gets out that we are now the traffic engineer of our city. So the treasurer comes in and says, you know, we installed that red light camera, but we never catch anyone. Can we make yellow shorter? You're like, uh, I don't know, but you're the treasurer, you pay my salary. So I guess let's make it a second. Here you go out to test. Yellow for one second, red immediately. 
drivers get caught, but the safety officer comes in and says, um, we keep having all these pedestrian accidents. Um, can we maybe make the, the time when red is on for the traffic and the don't walk is still on for the pedestrians a little bit longer so that there's a buffer? So they're like, ah, I know, that's at register address four. I'm going to make that um, four seconds for you. Got to try it out. One second of yellow. One, two, three, four. Pedestrians. And everyone's happy. City makes a lot of money from the red light camera. No insurance claims coming in from the pedestrian accidents. You have money to hire a chief data officer for your city. They come in and they're like, hey, um, so there's always these discussions about traffic light timing. Can't we use like machine learning? And you're like, oh man. <laughs> So you're like, all right, let's import machine learning, let's run some machine learning. Oh, these are some good traffic light times. How about we write them to the traffic light? Uh, so we start at address zero, we run machine learning, we program into the traffic light, we press the button. Oh, uh, that must be a case of bias in machine learning. It's biased <laughs> towards runners because our data set uh, was uh, collected when the data marathon came through town. All right, uh, the example is getting a bit silly, but I'm, I'm using it to make a point, obviously. Um, there's a lot of discussion in industry right now on what's the, what the right way to connect uh, the low-level control programs running on a PLC, how to connect them to the sort of modern innovations in software engineering that often run in the cloud. And the buzzwords here are often IIoT, industrial, which stands for Industrial Internet of Things, and or if you're in Europe, they say Industry 4.0, but actually mean the same thing. And um, one way I like to think about it is that there are really two control loops running. Uh, one is uh, the control loop that controls, that runs in the PLC and controls the field devices, and that runs in the sort of milliseconds per iteration cycle, it interfaces with the physical world and does all the things that are timing critical or safety critical. And it really implements like the laws of nature and the laws of the road, like don't show a green to both crossing traffics because you will have accidents and you will get sued. Um, the other control loop is the one that is influencing uh, the parameters of the inner control loop and uh, can do things like adjust to the time of day, to the traffic situation elsewhere in the city, to maybe insights gained from data science. And that control loop is running much less frequently, either minutes, sometimes only every couple of months. And that's the one that has the ability to do non-real-time things, things that take uh, an unpredictable amount of time, talk to databases, or reach out to web APIs, and sometimes it fails. And it doesn't matter because the inner control loop keeps running. Uh, and everyone is safe. That also means that for the control loop, the small, the inner control loop running on the PLC, you often have a regulated release cycle where someone needs to sign off and certifications need to be obtained, whereas on the one that you implement in maybe your Python code in the higher level language, uh, you can continue running your regular software release cycle with maybe bi-weekly sprints or whatever it is you're doing. Now, uh, now come a couple of busy slides. You're not meant to read all of them, but we looked at Modbus, and it's an okay protocol. You need to know like weird numbers, there's zeros floating around, but not. Um, there are many other protocols out there. In fact, there's a, a list of, uh, of industrial communication protocols in Wikipedia, which has about, I think, 50 entries. Uh, and I, what I did here is I listed all the ones for which we have Python packages on PyPI. Uh, this, the first slide are the vendor-specific ones. So if you purchase a PLC from one of those vendors, you are in luck because someone has put in the effort to implement this in Python, and you can just interface with it. If, however, you do not purchase a PLC that uh, is supported by one of those, you have to go to this slide, which lists all the open standards that uh, have been developed mostly for machine-to-machine -machine communication that we can tap into. The list is significantly longer. I only include the ones for which Python packages exist, and it sort of gets uh, the difficulty increases from top to bottom. So at the very top, I have Modbus, which is like the grandpa of the protocols. 40th birthday this year. We've covered this, and there are variants for serial port and network port. Um, then come the TCP IP based standards, which are affectionately known as the Office Communications Networking Standards by the industrial automation community, because you don't really have any real time guarantees. You don't know how long it takes for the message to arrive. That protocol has been built for resilience against error, not for time critical delivery of messages. Uh, there are a couple of industrial standards that do support this. Three of them are listed here. A couple others you might have to put in some extra work to build your own library. And it's actually not that hard. You get the standards document, 
do import socket, import C types, and you just start hacking away, implementing the right order of bytes to talk to the machines. It gets a little bit hotter in the third box, because those are the things where you still use the Ethernet cable, but no TCP IP, no more IP addresses for identifying other participants in networking. You can still do that. So first of all, I should say, there's only one, one uh, protocol supported by a Python package. There are about 30 others that uh, do not exist on PyPI. Some of them are really you can't because you cannot achieve the timing considerations. But the others you could do with sockets and C types. Uh, I actually learned about this by reading some of those packages mentioned in the small print here, raw socket Pi and DNet, to understand how you do networking in an environment where IP addresses aren't a thing, which was news to me. If you find yourself all the way at the bottom, uh, sorry for you, uh, because those are really standards that require custom hardware and sometimes custom types of cables. And your best shot, if you have to tap into that, is to purchase a conversion hardware or a gateway hardware that turns that traffic into network traffic for you. Two examples, Pi ADS is an implementation of Beckhoff's uh, ADS protocol. Uh, don't read all of it, just uh, it looks very similar to Modbus with the one difference that you can reference variables by name and you can subscribe to changes. Another one I really have to mention is OPC UA for which the amazing free OPC UA project exists. Now OPC UA is really the only one of those standards that you and I would recognize as having a beautiful API. Uh, one of the cool features about it is that it is discoverable. You point at the device, you connect to it, and you can discover a tree of objects that represent the variables and methods exposed by the device. I'm also mentioning this because the free OPC UA project has a number of Python packages in it that implement the standard, a client and server, another one with client and server and pure async I.O., and one called OPC UA client, which is this GUI-based thing that I have on the screen here. It's very actively maintained and really welcomes participation. If you're into this kind of stuff, you should check it out. I've reviewed 40-ish packages. I'm also running out of time in this talk, so I'm going to blast through this. A couple of things that really surprised me. There's a lot of activity recently. Uh, many packages have been started in, re in the last year. Many of them are actively maintained. Many Python 3 only, very few Python 2 only, which really tells me that this uh, is a space that's gaining traction compared to when I first did automation with Python about five years ago. Most of the activity is based in Europe, which influences which brands are supported and which protocols, because there are some regional preferences between Europe and America, mostly on what's supported. So you might, uh, you might see a preference towards uh, things that are popular in Europe. And just surprising to me, a lot of overlap with the home automation community, which I guess I was just totally not aware of before preparing for this talk. Cool. Talked about Python. So whenever you talk about industrial automation, someone comes out of the woodworks and asks, I have a Raspberry Pi at home. It cost me 30 bucks. It can do all of the things you just said. And the canonical answer to that is, <laughs> no, it can't. <laughs> uh, your Raspberry Pi will probably die in places that PLCs work because it's too cold, too hot, too humid, too salty. Uh, it doesn't work next to welding machines because of electromagnetic interference. It doesn't have ESD protection, so you blow up the chemicals factory, plug in the sensor the wrong way around, you fry your Raspberry Pi. It doesn't even mount to those DIN rails and work with the power supplies always used in most factories. And the manufacturer doesn't really give you supply chain guarantees. If you actually buy a PLC, you often have a guarantee that spare parts are available for several decades. So currently you see dates in the late 2020s and 2030s on manufacturer websites. That's on the hardware side. On the software side, I touched on this whole real-time story a couple of times. P PLCs are designed such that when you execute the code, no garbage collector or any of that nonsense comes in. You have guarantees about how long every instruction takes, and it's actually an uh, used in the advertisements and data sheets of TLCs for what these cycle times are. All the other things are really reliant on the fact that there is this real-time guarantee, uh, and now comes the plot twist. Maybe your Raspberry Pi is a PLC. So the next two slides list a few projects that actually give you traits of PLCs in Raspberry Pis. I should say first, if you don't care about any of the things on the previous slide, I mean, use your Raspberry Pi as is. If you do care about them, though, you might be interested in these things. The uh, very popular one to turn your Raspberry Pi into a PLC, at least software-wise, is CodeSys for Raspberry Pi. Now, the CodeSys is a package that exists for many types of PLCs and hardwares. And the way it works is that they developed a real-time kernel that lives next to your main operating system, in this case, Raspbian, that, can, that reserves some of the CPU capacity for real-time computations. So they can have these real-time guarantees. And then you use their free editor to write code that is compatible with that real-time environment. 
All the other projects on here do the same. OpenPLC is a very cool open source project actually written in Python that has an editor and one of those real-time environments. So that's worth checking out. And PyLC is slightly more limited in scope because it tries to emulate a proprietary Siemens programming language, but also has a runtime for Raspberry Pi. If you need the hardware stuff, you've got some products too. Uh, two options, really broadly speaking. You can either take the vanilla Raspberry Pi and add an add-on module to it that brings all the cool stuff you need, like a, a rugged power supply, uh, isolated I.O., support for various canvas and stuff like that. And that's what Pi Extend and Anduino, which I found out about really late, which there's no details, uh, do. So they add an add-on to your existing Raspberry Pi. The other option uh, that I found one manufacturer doing, that's the, the Revolution Pi product, they actually do not take the standard Raspberry Pi that you can order on the internet, and instead they only take the compute chip from it and replace everything else that's on the Raspberry Pi board with uh, components that meet the requirements of a PLC. So they end up with a new single board computer that doesn't look like a Raspberry Pi, but can fit into one of those cool enclosures that look exactly like a PLC. If I had time, someone could come up and ask the Arduino question. I would give a very similar answer to that, but uh, uh, slightly fewer products on that list. I'm out of time, though, and everyone says, hey, Jonas, time's up. We want to have lunch. But what should I do next if I want to learn more about this PLC stuff? So I prepared this last slide for you, which on the left lists things that you might want to try out next. And uh, next to it on the right has a couple of products and the projects uh, listed that might uh, move you in this direction. Also, there are a couple of appendix slides that you can look, look up online with longer lists of things. It goes from everything like free online simulators for ladder logic to using equipment that's actually used in real factories, which you often can buy on eBay. One word of warning on those, if you want to work with tools from the market leaders, which in the US is Alan Bradley, and in Europe and most of the rest of the world is Siemens and sometimes Mitsubishi, they can use software as a revenue source, so they charge you big license fees for the programming environment. If you go for smaller vendors, you often get the programming environment for free, uh, sometimes with a simula simulator. All right, that's my last slide. I don't have time for questions, but I did schedule an open space this afternoon where everyone's welcome to stop by, ask questions, play with the traffic light and the PLC. Um, obviously, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can't come, so my contact details are also on the slide. And one last thing, my, my work uh, has given me a lot of slack recently for preparing all this stuff, uh, time off and things. Um, I lead a team of automation engineers uh, using Python to automate a biotech factory. No ladder logic involved. Um, and we are currently five people. We're getting ready to hire our six, and we still have a slot open for a summer intern if you're kind of running late. So if that's interesting, you should also come talk to me. That's all from me. Thank you.